today I'm going to talk about the importance of a promise. And we're going to be looking in Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30. And I'm uh, saying about promises. There was a politician's promise. He went over to a tribe in Africa and uh, he talked to a villager there and he asked what their needs were. And they said, well, we have two basic needs, sir. Uh, one is we have a hospital, but we don't have any doctor. Well, he stepped back and pulled out his cell phone and punched in some numbers, put it up to his ear and started talking and walked off. And he came back and he said, okay, that's taken care of. The doctor will be here next week. What's your next most important need? He said, well, our second need is that we don't have any cell phone service at all in this village. So, <laughs> then there was a, others. Uh, well, there was another time. A little girl said, Daddy, do all fairy tales begin with once upon a time? And he said, well, honey, there are plenty of fairy, ta fairy tales that begin with, if I'm elected, I will. <laughs> so, I have promises there. You know, as I was thinking about this message, sometimes uh, people can recall a promise or, or a perceived promise that they had from their parents, and their parents weren't able to keep up with that. I mean, some of the story often goes, uh, Dad has to be out of town quite a bit, and he tells his son, Son, we'll go fishing this next weekend. And then something happens, and he's not able to be there. And I'm legitimately not able to be there to keep that promise. And it just stays with the person. And I was trying to think about that. And I was thinking about in my own family. And I've been percolating this for two or three days. And I don't remember any broken promises. Now, I'm not saying there weren't any. And I think maybe... Uh, part of it is because I remember us asking for forgiveness <laughs> for different things. And but fortunately, I don't know what it was we asked for forgiveness for. So I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and there, but a promise, the importance of a promise. Here in Numbers chapter 30, it talks about the law of vows. It goes like this, and Moses spoke to the leaders of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. If a woman also vows a vow to the Lord, and binds herself by a bond, being in her, father, her father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow and has, and her bond with which she has bound herself, or her soul, and her father says nothing to her, then all of her vows shall stand, and every bond with which she has bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallows her on the day that he hears, not any of her vows or her bonds with which she has bound her soul shall stand. And the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. And if she had a doll, a husband, when she vowed or uttered anything out of her lips with which she bound her soul, and her husband heard it and said nothing to her on the day that he heard it, then her vow shall stand, and her bonds with which she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow that she vowed, and that which she uttered with her lips, with which she bound her soul of none effect. And the Lord shall forgive her, but every vow of a widow and of a woman who is divorced, by which they have bound their souls, shall stand against her. 
And if she vowed in her husband's house or bound her soul by a bond with an oath, and her husband heard it and said nothing to her and did not disallow her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond with which she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband has utterly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatever proceeded out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the bond of her soul shall not stand. Her husband has made them void, and the Lord shall forgive her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul, her husband may establish it, or her husband may make it void. But if her husband um, altogether says nothing to her from day to day, then he establishes all her vows or all her bonds that are on her. He confirms them because he said nothing to her on the day that he heard them. But if he shall in any way make them void when he has heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. These are the statutes that the Lord commanded Moses between a man and his wife, between the father and his daughter, who is still in her youth in her father's house. And then there are a couple more verses that relate to making a vow. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 21 through 23, we read, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. And Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, says, When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Think about vows here. The vows are promises that we make, and these are promises that they're going to make before the Lord. And sometimes we, uh, we speak before we think. And sometimes we make vows with our lips that perhaps we should not make. And uh, I know we was talking here about this is in the economy of Moses' times, ancient Israel, and the laws that they worked by. And uh, as we think about this, though, today, the importance of a promise, we're going to consider the blessings of authority, the blessings of obedience and the blessings of commitment. I know we say here, well, this is Old Testament. <laughs> well, we come over into the New Testament and Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, uh, it talks about uh, see that the husband uh, love his wife and show that he loves his wife and that the wife reverence her husband. And back in there a little bit, <laughs> there's a statement there that says, for the husband is the head of the wife. Now, uh, one lady I heard say one time, well, I'm the neck, and I can turn the head. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know whether you like that or not, but that's what's in Scripture. That's what it says. The husband is the head of the wife, and that is New Testament. It speaks there of the apostles and pastors, and it says for them, to not lord it over God's heritage. In other words, they were to be overseers of the church and overseers of what was going on. And yet they were not to do it in a bad way. Neither husbands to do it in a bad way. If you're in a position of authority, you should be a good person in authority. And that you should have care for those that are under you. And if you're under someone else, then... Uh, there is a blessing of being under someone else. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But also here it says that children are to obey their parents. A lot of parents know that verse. You might even know the reference to that one. I've forgotten it now, but I know I used to know it. <laughs> children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So you have 
the blessing of authority. Then there's the blessing of obedience to authority. And when we have authority, we have this, that there is protection that is given to us by authority. Where we have laws and we have things like this. Now, sometimes we talk about, uh, I guess part of the time we'll have to confess our sins, on our way to church. There's one stop sign, it's out in the middle of the country, and there's nobody behind us, there's nobody ahead of us, and there's nobody to our left, and there's nobody to our right. And one of us uh, is really inclined to just sail on through that stop sign, and the other one is inclined to <coughs> stop a lot of times, even when nobody else is around. And uh, so we have this playful argument going back and forth about being a person of duty or a person of freedom. But if you stop and think about it, now I think about the town down south here. I just never could understand that right, coming in to Johnson City, coming from the east, coming into town there, and immediately you get in town, you're confronted with a stop sign. And there's no traffic going the other direction either way. I just never have understood that. And then going out of town, and out now it's down by the funeral home there. There's a stop sign there. It makes a little more sense now with the, there's cross traffic and stuff there. But back in the old days, I never did understand those two stop signs. But you need to stop at the stop sign. Because the stop sign provides order in society. The laws provide protection. And most laws are made for protection, for helping other people and doing that. So there's a blessing of that. So there's a blessing of obedience to authority. And so this passage of Scripture is talking about uh, making a vow to God. And we read one verse that said it's better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not keep it. And you would say, well, why would we even make a vow ever then? Well, I think there's a reason for that, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But there is a protection that was put on here on certain segments of their society. And in this case, it was a way out for somebody that made a rash statement. The problem is, if you were a man, you couldn't get out of it. If you were a son, you couldn't get out of it. You just couldn't get out of it. Ladies could get out of it if their husband were to disallow the vow or if their father were to disallow the vow. And hopefully they would be thinking as they're doing this, is it a rash statement that they shouldn't have made? Is it something that's binding that's going to cause a problem within their lives? Well, there was an out by the authority that was over them. Sometimes I've seen it like this, uh, and when you're thinking about children and parents and them being under authority, there is a level of protection for children to be under the authority of their parents. And it's kind of like an umbrella, and you've got all these fiery darts coming down off of you, and they bounce off of the umbrella whenever you are subject to the authority that's over you. Now we have other authorities. We have bosses whenever we go to work. Now sometimes children say, well, I'm tired of mom and dad telling me what to do. And so I, I'll just get away from home. And so how's it, how do they get away from home? Well, they go down and meet the recruiter and they get in the military. Oh yeah, that's really smart, isn't it? You wanna get out from under authority? And that's an expert's of authority when you get there. And sometimes it does them a lot of good uh, to be able to do that. But there's a protection being under authority. Now, one thing that's important, and I think that when we teach our children, that we need to teach them to be under proper authority. Because though we're to respect, I guess, everybody that's older than us, or courteous or whatever doesn't mean we have to obey everybody that's older than us because there are some people that are predators that would want to come along and do terrible things to children 
So you need to teach your children. They need to obey authority, yes. And it used to be <laughs> that when they were in school, if they got a whip in the school, they would probably get one at home because they were, you know, respecting teachers so much. Well, in this day and age, we've got to even be careful of what's going on, what's presented in textbooks, because some things that are being presented in textbooks are against the Word of God. In fact, they are against nature. They are against those things. So we're going to have to teach our children to be discerning. And so it's kind of like the apostles. You know, when out they started preaching in the name of Jesus, and people would get saved. And, and, and in one case, these uh, people got saved, and, and they stopped buying their idols. <laughs> and the people that made the idols got all upset about that. And uh, early in the book of Acts, so whenever they first were preaching in the name of Jesus, some of the authorities came and got the apostles and told them, commanded them to not to preach in that name anymore. And they said, well, whether it's right for us to do this, you judge, you figure it out. But we can only do what we have seen and heard. And we know that God is true and real. And you judge whether it's right or not, but we have decided we must obey God rather than man. So it's important that we be under our authorities when they are proper authorities. And if you have a boss and you follow their rules and they make a mistake, then you got some protection there because you did what they told you to do, even if they made a mistake, and it wasn't the best thing for the company. But there is that there comes a point to where you're going to have to decide. Are you going to obey God? Or are you going to obey men? Now, but, uh, whenever we had school over here, Accelerated Christian Education, there was a man uh, that was pastor of a church in uh, Garland, Texas. And uh, they had started a school in the early days of the Christian school movement. And, and this was years ago. Now it wouldn't be unusual, I guess. But the, there was a lady that came in and she was telling them what they needed to do because that's what they tell all the schools to do. And so he would try to comply where they should. And finally, she told him, well now on this certain day, you're going to have to have your little boys come to school and dress up in dresses. And he said, ma'am, we have reached a point. <laughs> and you're going to have to figure out sometime in this day and age, where is the point? Where is the line? And it, can it come to where we have reached a point and we're not going any further? So, but there's legitimate authority. But so you need to know the word of God. And... The protection from God is, if you obey God, he will protect you. And, well, I mean, I, you might get thrown in jail. Your life might even be taken. But that's kind of like the lady one time that she was sick. And she had a 21-year-old son. The man who told this story said that one day uh, she was kind of too sick go to work and so she called in to work and she didn't go and uh, well so but the next day she was okay and she was able to go but after that she was concerned she went and talked to her pastor about it and he said well if you're too sick to go to work what would be the worst that could happen if you didn't go to work and she said well I wouldn't get paid and he said well really is that the worst that could happen? She said, well, I wouldn't have any money for food. He said, yeah. Is there anything worse than that? She said, well, we might starve to death. And he said, well, she was a Christian. He said, well, what will happen after that? She said, well, I'll be in heaven. <laughs> and so, next time she got sick, was not able to go on to work, she called in and she was still in bed and 
He said her 21-year-old sloth came walking in and said, Mom, aren't you going to go to work today? And she said, no, I'm too sick to go today. And he said, well, uh, you know, what's going to happen here? And so the next day he came in and she still go, didn't go to work. And he said, Mom, what's going to happen? And she said, I don't know. I guess we'll just starve to death and she all over and went back to sleep. And the next day he went out and got a job. But the point of it is, you might get thrown in prison, and persecution may come, and your life may be taken from you. But if you know the Lord, heaven is real. And, it, it, and we've become painfully aware of that, reminders of it here in recent days. But it is real. It is real. It is a wonderful place, a wonderful thing. We're going to obey God rather than man. There was King Saul in the Old Testament, and he was to command his army to go in and utterly destroy the enemy, and actually to destroy their flocks and things like that. Well, Samuel came back, and he found Saul, and he heard some noise, and he heard the bleeding of sheep and goats. And uh, the noise of oxen. And uh, King Saul said, I've done what was commanded. We went out and we destroyed them. And Samuel said, what's that sound of sheep and goats and bulls that I hear out here? And he said, well, I kept those for sacrifice. See, but he did. And that part of the Old Testament tells us that behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To listen to God is better than the fat of rams that are used for sacrifice. There's a blessing of obedience. But then there is a commitment. <laughs> Why would you ever want to make a vow if it says that it is so important that you shall not slack to pay it if you make a vow to the Lord, you shall not slack to do it. And it's better not to vow than to make one. Well, why do we want to make a commitment? Well, I can think of one reason. <laughs> and some and many of you have experienced this reason. One time you were walking around and you, you saw someone who caught your eye. And uh, it just got worse as time went by. And it got to where that was all you could think about. And finally you found out it went both ways. And you decided you wanted to commit your life to that person. And you did that because of love. And the reason why we want to make vows to God is because we love our Heavenly Father. We want to serve Him, and we're willing to commit our life to Him, even if it means going to the death. Now, uh, one time, uh, over in, I think it's Hebrews, but it said, You have not yet resisted unto blood, but there have been many people who have resisted unto blood. Now you think I need to go back in the Old Testament and tell you that that's where that happened. You think I need to go in the first century and talk about Polycarp and some of those people like that and tell you that that's where that happened. You think I need to go back in the last century and talk about different areas and pockets of the world. But there have been more martyrs in the 20th century than there have in all of previous time of history. And it's getting worse here in the 21st century, and we do not hear about it. I found, I just heard this week, someone, his name is Thomas, I forgot his last name, Williams, I think. But he has done research in it, and he's found out that there are Christians all over the world that are giving their lives for Christ today. Now, fortunately, so far, where we are here, we don't have to give our lives with our blood, but the Bible says you should give your body as a 
living sacrifice. But why would you want to do that? Because you have one who loved you so much. Because he first loved you. One who looked down through history. And you had the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in Genesis chapter 1, it, it speaks in plural there. It said, let us make man in our image. And you had the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And you had God the Father. And then you come into the Gospel of John that tells us that Jesus Christ was involved in the act of creation. Without him was not anything made that was made. But, so that God said, let us make man. And I said, well, are you going to make a wind-up toy? <laughs> he will do everything that you want. You can program him to do however you want to do it. And he said, no, I want him to love me. I want to love him, and I want him to love me. And when it speaks of man in Scripture, it's talking about mankind. And so he took the rib out of Adam, and he made Eve, and he made mankind. And he wanted men and women to be able to love him. And in order to do that, they had to freely be able to choose to do that. This analogy I gave a second ago, you may have somebody that catches your eye, well, that doesn't mean that they don't have any choice in the matter. <laughs> you know, you've got to catch their eye too for it to really work, for love to be that way. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And this plan was done in eternity past that God would give his son. Jesus would give his life so that you and I would not have to face the penalty of death. And we just have such gratitude and such love. That's why we would make a commitment. Lord, I will serve you. I will serve you. There was a man named Mel Trotter. He was born in 1870. And... Uh, in the home that he grew up in, his dad owned a saloon. And his dad sold so much liquor, but he also drank almost as much as what he sold. And so he grew up in that kind of home. But his mother was a praying mom, and so she stayed home and prayed for them. Well, whenever he got up in the teenage years, he thought he wanted to follow in his dad's footsteps, so to speak. And he wanted to be in the saloon. Well, his parents wanted him to go away to school. And, uh, but he, he would rather spend the time in the saloon. Well, he did, though, learn to trade. He learned how to be a barber. And so whenever he was barbering, evidently, he, he learned well. And I guess he was a functioning <laughs> alcoholic because during the day he could do barbering without cutting somebody's ear off. And uh, he started making money. And when he made enough money, he left home. And, but then the alcohol began to take over. And then... He wasn't functioning all the time, and he lost his job. Well, then he moved to a place called Pearl City, Iowa. And I talked about that, somebody catching your eye. He came around a group of young Christians, and there was a young lady, and her name was Lottie Fisher, and she caught his eye. And out of their freedom of will, they decided to marry each other. But after they had been married, it wasn't too long that two things shocked her. <laughs> one was, she found out he was an alcoholic. And the other one was, that he had lost his job just right quick after they had gotten married. Well, he said, I need to get away from this environment. So they moved out to a rural area, and there were no saloons around close to where they moved. But there were other establishments that sold liquor and alcohol. 
and he found out where those were and he went back and it had a hold on him. And then he added gambling to what he was doing and so he had a further addiction. And for six years though, he would say time after time, I need to quit. I need to quit. And so there would be the day that he would make the vow, I'm going to quit. But then he'd always go back. And for six years, he tried to quit. Well, then they had a baby. And so he came home and he saw this child. And he said, I'll quit for my wife and for my child. But it only lasted a couple of days. Because every time that he looked at the child, it reminded him of what a failure he was as a father. Well, then, whenever the child was two years old, Mel Trotter had gone out and he had been on a 10-day drunk and he came home. And he, whenever he came in the door, he found his wife sobbing and crying. Now you think, this is not fiction story, this is a real story. It really happened. And he came in and the baby was in his wife's arms and it had drawn his last breath. And so they were standing at the casket and he put his arm around his wife and he said, I swear I will never drink again. But he felt like it was all his fault, and so he began to blame himself. And because he blamed himself, how did he always handle that? And so he went back to the bottle to take care of it. And then it just kept getting worse, and, and he would be away from home for a couple of days at a time. And or like that time before, he'd been gone for 10 days. And so one day, he hopped on a freight, and he ended up in Chicago. It was January 19, 1897. And he walked around, he didn't have any money, and he sold his shoes. And he got enough money to drink. And he happened to come to the part of town where there was the... Pacific Garden Mission, and uh, a man named uh, Tom Mackey was outside of the Pacific Garden Mission, and he came to him and he said, why don't you come on in here, we can get you a meal, we can get you a place to sleep for the night, and there will be shelter, and so he came on in. When he came in, at the front, the superintendent of the mission uh, Mel, <coughs> excuse me, Harry Morgan, the superintendent of the mission, stood up and gave his testimony as to how years earlier he had come in this mission and he had gotten saved. Well, Mel had been asleep through most of it, <laughs> but he had heard enough to hear that God was able to heal and to release someone from the grips of addiction. So after the service was over with, he went and talked to uh, Harry Monroe. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, Monroe explained to him the plan of salvation. You see, all these earlier vows that he had made was, I'm going to quit. I can handle this. I'm going to quit. And he did not quit. And he did not quit. But this night, he committed his life to Jesus. And he never drank again after that. And he became the leader of a mission in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But that's why we would want to make a vow. God loves us. We love him. We want to make a commitment to him, to serve him. And whenever we do, and we make a commitment in the power of the Lord, we're not doing it in our own strength. And that's where the scripture kicks in. It says, 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's how it works for some people. Have you ever come to Christ? <laughs> Have you ever really done that in your life? 